What's new at SpaceX's Starbase? When can we see Super Heavy Booster 4 do a first static fire? And what's happening with Starship 21's heat shield? Why exactly did SpaceX move a completely new booster to the retirement parking lot? And finally, what's so special about Rocket Lab's latest neutron rocket update? Let's find out. What about it? Go for launch. Or go for launch. Let's light this candle. Ignition sequence start. My name is Felix and I am your host for today's episode of What About It? And as always, there's been a lot going on in the space industry lately, so let's dive right in. Starship Updates! <laughs> Even though there are constant rivalries between important topics in my research, the biggest news right now regarding SpaceX and Starbase likely is Booster 4. It's entering service. And just looking at the scenery shows how close Starship's Super Heavy Booster 4 is to entering the hot phase of the test campaign. For the first time, the world will see the largest first stage of a rocket ever in operation. Covers are being mounted. The orbital launch mount is being prepared. SpaceX is making significant progress towards the static fire campaign. My prediction right now, two to three static fires this month's orbital launch at the beginning of January. The static fire test will likely culminate in a full stack 29 Raptor engine static fire. And once the rocket is let loose on launch day, the orbital launch mount will have to endure 7.5 mega newtons of thrust. Double of what a Saturn V was able to put out. To withstand these forces, the orbital launch mount will need protection. What you're looking at here is the freshly installed protective cover for the quick disconnect arm on the launch table. And the SpaceX workers next to it once more give a good comparison of the scale of things at Starbase. By now, Booster 4 has been attached to a crane and is waiting for the SPMT to be rolled towards the orbital launch mount. And once they lift it onto the orbital launch table, you'll know that the action is about to start. At the production side, things evolved as we predicted on Y+, our sub-channel, already. And thanks to his new gear, Chief was able to produce these pictures. Hollywood quality. Thank you so much for being a part of the team, Kevin. You rock. This is Booster 4. I've talked about this a few times now, and I know why this is such a controversial topic. Why would SpaceX build a booster just to scrap it? Isn't it more likely that Booster 4 was just moved to the presentation area in preparation for a Starship update? After all, Musk already tweeted about it. We're finally getting another Starship presentation with the latest update directly from the mastermind himself. And now that Booster 5 is standing next to Ship 15 and 16, it would be the perfect spot to do this. Or SpaceX just needed to free up the high bay and thus move Booster 5 over here just to have more space. While all this could be true, there's one more possibility. SpaceX has moved on. Booster 5 was produced too quickly. There are no V1 Raptor engines for it to launch. SpaceX does not intend to build more V1 Raptors and wants to switch to Raptor V2 as soon as possible. So Booster 5 is facing the same fate that, for example, Ship 16 met. Obsolete before it was even tested. And there's quite a bit of evidence out there to support this theory. Booster production is currently ahead of engine production. And then the recent leaked email where Musk clearly stated that V2 Raptor production isn't ramping up quickly enough. That he wants Starships to fly payloads as soon as possible and that for this, Raptor V1 won't work. In the end, we'll have to wait and see, but don't be surprised if Booster 5 is history. If we'll never see it fly, Booster 7 would be next in line. A milestone booster, a lot of changes, different thrust dome as Raptor V2 will likely have other connectors, more ready for commercial service, fast iterative design approach. What do you think? Will SpaceX ever fly Booster 5 or is it going to retire without ever seeing any action? As always, tell me in the comments. Right next to all of this, the Mega Bay is growing quickly. By now, the first paneling has gone up on the sidewalls and the progress is uplifting. The Mega Bay is growing and it will be crucial for the upcoming years. Giving space for six to eight prototypes simultaneously will enable SpaceX to have a whole pipeline of super heavy boosters and starships ready for more and more launches. And that's the entire plan behind it as well. This is RGV aerial photography and Mauricio's latest picture showing the scenery from above. If we now mark the surface area of both the high bay and the mega bay, the size difference becomes apparent. It's about double the space of the high bay. 
Here's another one of Chief's stunning videos. These are thermal heat tile technicians at work on the nose cone of Ship 21. I feel that this will never be part of Ship 21 because of the whole boost of 5 retirement theory, but we'll see and this is not the most essential part of this footage anyway. First of all, it's another one of those workers for scale videos. This footage gives an excellent feel for how large a standard Starbreak actually is. For those who don't know, Starbreak is SpaceX's internal name for those large hexagonal heat tiles. They are pretty large. This also looks so much better than on Ship 20, which is currently being put through its paces at the launch site. This heat shield here is only the second one SpaceX is crafting and it already looks worlds apart from the first one. I'm pointing this out as there is great concern in the community that SpaceX might be facing a potential showstopper problem with the heat shields. This view should boost your confidence quite a bit. Thank you comments should be addressed to Chief right under this video. Last but not least, let's take a look at the current road closures for Boca Chica and Highway 4. We're doing this because officially scheduled road closures are an excellent indicator for upcoming test activity at SpaceX's Starbase. Lately, there have been a lot of cancelled road closures and fluctuating dates. As of recording the episode, everything from yesterday, Wednesday the 8th, to tomorrow, Friday the 10th was cancelled. But we still have two active closures for Monday and Tuesday of next week from 10am to 6pm. As said earlier, whenever SpaceX starts lifting Booster 4 onto the orbital launch mount, you'll know that the booster action is about to start. Next up we'll talk Rocket Lab and the latest update on the upcoming Neutron rocket. It's quite an interesting concept, so stay tuned. The Y family needs your support. Give the video a like, subscribe and share it with your friends on Twitter or Facebook to show the YouTube algorithm that you appreciate the content. Looking for a more direct way of support? Become a Patreon or YouTube member by clicking the join button right under the video and get some awesome perks. Gain access to our Discord server where you can meet me and the rest of the community or get a completely ad-free release of each and every episode provided just for channel members. Or do you know about the Y Warehouse? Shop for your next Starship shirt, hoodie or cap and look as awesome as you feel. We also have a brand new sub-channel called Y+. More Y, more Starbase and more space enthusiasm. The link is in the description. Subscribe and ring the bell. Rocket Lab Neutron Update Peter Beck recently gave us the honor again and unveiled Rocket Lab's latest update on the Neutron rocket and it had some very unexpected twists in it to say the least. This is not a conventional rocket. This is what a rocket should look like in 2050. These are the opening words of Beck's recent Neutron update unveiled to the public on December 2nd and no, this time it's not about eating a hat. This time it's about a next generation rocket, reliability, reusability and cost hard baked into the design. Rocket Lab's approach is straightforward. It's the commercial one. Look at the market, try to find out what the customers moving inside the market will need next and give them that. In Rocket Lab's analysis that's 80% small constellation satellites. And they will likely be correct with this assumption. Satellite constellations without a doubt are going to be a big part of the next few decades. Especially if launch costs constantly drop further down as they already do now and will even more in the future with rockets like Neutron. It's the commercial one. Look at the market, try to find out what the customers moving inside the market will need next and give them that. What's changed in the past 9 months since Rocket Lab first introduced Neutron? What you're looking at here is a 3D model of the original Neutron design idea unveiled by Rocket Lab at the beginning of this year. Now let's compare that to the recently updated design. Casper Stanley, as always, did a fantastic job creating these models and that makes it so easy. Wow, what's happened to Neutron? It looks like a completely different rocket design now. And that's because it is. Where the first design was a standard rocket design, the new Neutron design is not at all a conventional rocket. Hull design, landing legs, fairing design. From straight hull design with traditional staging to a conical hull design with pronounced legs and a somewhat strangely shaped fairing. Anyone getting some James Bond vibes here? Anyone? 
The idea is also to create the lightest upper stage ever built to maximize payload capacity and reduce the rocket's not reused parts to an absolute minimum. The new Neutron design will only reuse the first stage. Now here's the twist though, the first stage kind of is almost the entire rocket. To drive down the cost as much as possible, Rocket Lab decided to integrate the fairing into the first stage and effectively turn the first stage into a transport vehicle for the second stage. The fairing opens up and releases the second stage with payload. Then the fairing closes again and the whole first stage re-enters the atmosphere. Rocket Lab is also not planning to land Neutron on barges. It will always be returning back to the launch site. They'll be using the shape to their advantage to guide the rocket back. Canards at the top of the rocket will control the flight path on descent. A landing burn and that's it. What lands back on Earth is a complete first stage, including fairings, ready to receive the next upper stage with payload. 40 meters height, 7 meters diameter, 5 meters internal fairing diameter, 8 tons payload to LEO, 15 tons max payload to LEO and almost 500 tons of lift off mass. Rocket Lab has been able to impress since its foundation in 2006 and it very much seems like they want to keep doing just that. Neutron is still slated to enter business in 2024. Test tanks are being produced right now and Archimedes, the new engine to power Neutron, will undergo first tests as early as next year. What an epic new project. I'm very much looking forward to seeing this fly. Peter Beck and the team at Rocket Lab, you rock. There is no better way to learn than by working through problems yourself and Brilliant provides exactly that. Brilliant is an interactive learning platform that lets you tackle new math, science and computer science concepts in fun and hands-on ways. I use Brilliant for my own research and to learn difficult topics I'd otherwise have trouble understanding. Want an intuitive introduction to the essentials of geometry? Or do you want to double down and focus on the core ideas at the heart of calculus? You won't need to memorize long messy formulas and endless facts. Open your eyes to the world around you by solving puzzles with science. On Brilliant it's not about memorizing or regurgitating facts for a test. You can just pick a course you're interested in and get started. Feeling stuck or made a mistake, you can read the explanations to find out more and learn at your own pace. Furthermore, as the holiday season arrives, Brilliant makes an awesome gift for any of the ambitious learners in your life. Whether it's an inquisitive niece, an all-knowing parent or the neighbor who seems to have everything, I know your curious loved ones of all ages will be excited to grow with Brilliant's interactive learning approach. So hurry, the first 200 of you to go to the link below will get 20% of Brilliant's annual premium subscription for yourself or for someone else. At the end of today's episode I want to give the team at Starship Shuffle a quick shout out as well. Nope, this is not sponsored. They've made a Starship building card game with hundreds of nods to the SpaceX community, including contributions from Tony Bela, Deli Hopper and even me. If you want one, a link to order it can be found in the description. I am not sponsored, but this is a fantastic way to play out Starship history from home. Well worth it. Today's team shout out goes to the guy editing this. We have a new team member. His name is Brian. Everyone say hi to Brian. No, not to the screen, he can't hear you. Write a comment maybe, he'll love that for sure. You're doing a fantastic job, don't get overwhelmed. We've got your back and we're glad you were able to join us. Here's to many more fun projects with you in the future. Brian, you rock. Who? Yes, meh, yes. Project, project with you. Blah, blah, that. Let's do that again. Who? Yes, meh, yes. Project, project with you. Blah, blah, that. I'm spitting while talking. These are the opening words of Peter click 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 click. That's what I wanted to say. Yes.